Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. I'm really happy to share a chat with anarchist and historian Barry Pateman. Barry, born in the early 1950s, grew up in a working-class coal mining town of Doncaster in the UK and became an anarchist in the 1960s in London. He's a long-standing member of the Kate Sharpley Library, which covers histories of little-known anarchists and events in history. Barry has also contributed to and edited numerous books, including Chomsky and Anarchism, a two-book document collection alongside Candace Falk of the works of Emma Goldman, Bloodstained, 100 Years of Leninist Counter-Revolution, and many more titles, often available from AK Press. We talk about anarchist history, community, repression, defeat, insularity, popular fronts with authoritarian Marxists, class analysis, and how to beat back capitalism. You can find Kate Sharpley Library at katesharpleylibrary.net. You'll notice that in this chat, we're mostly taking a slight break from the 24-7 COVID show for our broadcast, though the topic is touched upon. If you're looking to hear anarchist-relevant perspectives concerning the pandemic and organizing, we do suggest people check out episode 33 of the A-Radio Network's Bad News, Angry Voices from Around the World, which is up at our website and also available at a-radio-network.org. I would also suggest checking out some of the awesome shows in the Channel Zero Network, of which we are a member. For instance, Kite Line Radio produces a weekly show featuring the voices of prisoners and formerly incarcerated on all sorts of topics. Here's a jingle for their show. KiteLine is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand-to-hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on KiteLine, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. I'd like to recommend listeners check out a recent call to general strike on May Day by People's Strike, which includes Cooperation Jackson. The beginning of the call, which can be found linked in our show notes, starts... The COVID-19 pandemic has starkly revealed the inequalities and injustices that daily plague the world. The triple crisis of viral plague, systemic economic breakdown, and the failure and or unwillingness of governments to provide necessary protections, especially for the poor and people subjected to white supremacy, ethnocentrism, xenophobia, and misogyny has thrown us into a fight for our lives. The, quote, free markets, unquote, that right-wing political figures like Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Jair Bolsonaro, and others are seeking to protect and rely upon to address the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to produce chaos and needless suffering for millions of people. The economic nationalism and imperial rivalry we see on full display in the midst of this pandemic magnify the threat of war. In the U.S., we are fed a steady stream of lies and authoritarian posturing. From Palestine to South Africa to Brazil to the U.S. and beyond, oppressive regimes are actively sacrificing vulnerable people and communities and treating frontline workers as utterly disposable. We say enough. It is time to stand up. It's time to fight back for our lives and for our futures. And again, you can find that call out at cooperationjackson.org under their announcements. So would you mind introducing yourself for the audience? Uh, yes, my name's Barry. Well, uh, Barry, would you mind telling us a little bit about like uh, where you grew up and when and what, what it was like growing up, what the political climate was like? Sure. I grew up in uh, Doncaster, Yorkshire, in, in England. It was a very, very working class community centered, centered essentially on, on mines. But there was other industries, tractor making, um, nylon factories, all sorts of what you and I would call in heavy industry. And I grew up around the coal mining areas. And that was a, an interesting experience. Uh, looking back now, I realize it was rather unique. Um, it was an experience where I was actually able to meet and talk to some rather politically committed working class men and women who had been militants 
for quite a long time. And they were militants of what you and I and everyone listening, I hope, would recognize as the left. So there were Trotskyist groups in some coal mining villages, Communist Party groups in other coal mining villages. And in fact, the Communist Party had quite a, quite a presence in the National Union of Mine Workers. And uh, there are all sorts of things you could do. You could go to a, a, a Marxist study class. You could go to a Trotsky study class if you wanted. Or if you are like me, you sort of kept a, a vague distance between them, but was always aware it was there. Of course, a lot of the people I knew had nothing to do with politics in that sense. So we went out to the bars and the clubs, listening to soul music, went to sport, went to rugby, but there was, in essence, a community feel. You knew basically most people by sight, and you knew most people by reputation, if not by if you didn't know them well. Uh, you didn't necessarily like them at times, but if there was a strike, say in 1972 coal miner strike or the 84, 85 strike, they were there, most of them, with you. Um, and, and I think my definition of community has always come from that experience. And it's not like what people in anarchist circles talk about community now, which, as far as I can see, is everybody thinking exactly the same, uh, even within a certain tendency of anarchism. This is our community. This is my community. And it's not really a community. It's just people who think like I do. My experience, my definition of community is people who may think differently from you but you have a shared opposition to what I could best describe as them, those people uh, who, who will try and control and regulate your life, will assess you as what you're worth in terms of your productivity and nothing else, and ignore, in a sense, the humanity that's inside you, because there's no room for it. As I said, it doesn't mean you particularly like everybody. That would be naive. Are you... I mean, we can't pretend that an organization like the Senate in Spain, which had up to a million members, everybody loved each other or liked each other. There were severe differences, but there was a common belief that capitalism was a, a vicious, um, evil, manipulative system that took away your physical and emotional dignity. That was then, and I think it's rather different now, because I think I would not spend time chatting to old-time Communist Party members now. I think I've, I've gone beyond that in my thinking and where I think I'd like to see anarchism be. But th at that, as a young boy and man growing up, some of those people influenced me tremendously in their dedication to study. And they taught me that learning did not have to come from universities or schools, or schools certainly. It could come from within. You could teach each other and learn together. So and that's where I grew up. I took part in certain strikes, certain activities, and gradually I moved um, almost, I think, uh, I, I like to say organically, but that sounds really fucking pretentious. I mean, <laughs> I just sort of moved towards what you and I would recognize as anarchism, I hope. I began to read papers like Freedom, which left me rather uneasy, uh, and then later on, of course, I read Black Flag, the Bulletin of the Anarchist, Black Cross, and other reading material, and gradually came towards anarchism. Now, what I didn't know, of course, in the other villages, there were other people going on that journey, but I really didn't see much of them, because our life in those days was quite constrained, uh, and we never had the interweb to interact with. But in a way, I was on my own, and then more people came, and we talked about things, and we were worried about the way that the Communist Party wanted to control the miners' union. We were worried about, you know, their lack of uh, action in sort of living conditions, blah, blah, blah. There, there was all sorts of things, and that's where I moved to, and then I physically moved to London, and that probably was the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> well, so... You have these ideas of like questioning the the centralization of power by the Communist Party and the Miners Union yes. or attempting to control it. And you had all these examples of Marxist and Trotskyist study groups coming up yes. around and socialist and, and communist like party operatives. How did how did you first 
come into contact with it's it's easy to understand there is something other than what we're seeing as an anti-capitalist alternative but when did you first come into contact with anarchism or libertarian socialism or or any of those like in terms of a number of people when i got to london and uh, for a while i played that delicious game where i was a working class man you know i knew the truth about life and you were all middle class so to speak and but that's when i first met them i i re- I'd, I'd got papers from freedom and i'd read uh, little bits by alexander berkman but to be honest i couldn't quite put them into perspective of my life and the people around me it was only when that funny enough when i was at a distance from it that i could i could see where berkman's writing say went but i have to say and, and it's something i perhaps talk about later on when i began to meet people who associated in the anarchist milieu is that the word a milieu most of them didn't read much they had a sort of class consciousness of, of who they were men and women who were part of a certain class and there were there was an orientation to 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 other classes usually antagonistic or cynical but it wasn't as though we actually went through those reading groups in anarchist circles that the trots had done and the communist party i I suppose a few people may have done it but for us it was and this is a dangerous thing to say it was almost an intuitive instinctive thing which then became cemented by what we read after so for me reading came after my my interest in anarchism in a sense or real reading and in some cases i still have trouble reading what is called the classics much of my sense of anarchism was the people i hung around with the sense of who they were the way we saw the world together the way we saw groups of at work or not at work all that came really by conversation chatting in the pubs laughing joking going on demonstrations certainly taking part in rent strikes supporting tenants groups etc 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 you know supporting all sorts of activities but it wasn't tremendously theory driven it was actually much more empathetic and and uh, and emotionally driven i think and I, i would say you know apropos of what I've been reading about anarchist history, I, I believe that was really common from certainly in England from you know, 1880s onwards. So you mentioned going into to London, and and I'm wondering what kind of what kind of organizations and and uh, yeah gatherings did you participate in? What what did the scene look like? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I I I picked up I think in in Finsbury Park a, a copy of the Bulletin of the Anarchist Black Cross before it became, you know, black flag. And I was amazed by it, really. The language and its concerns were for people imprisoned who were anarchists. The language was one of what you might call contestation, taking on the state, taking on, you know, the whole idea of of, of what anarchism had become and challenging it, challenging it and drawing on, I think, people like myself's experience it, it it really made sense to me reading it and then black flag of course and it, and it was black flag and the bulletin the anarchist black cross that moved me in a way really very clearly towards anarchism then there was a some fragos press anarchist review uh, later when stuart moved to sunday that was a great educator for me uh, people like paul average wrote for it and uh, you know, from this little, you know, this farmhouse in a little remote Scottish island, these reviews will come out thicker and thicker each issue, full of historical detail and interesting ideas that provided an education for me, certainly. I was also involved with support for Spanish prison, anarchist prisoners, and through that, the anarchist Black Cross and, that, and anarchist prisoners all over Europe, especially. And that was a really interesting experience because although it was tough at times in England, you know, you weren't going to get shot, hopefully. And, you you know, it was a different world. And, and especially we were drawn, of course, to the Spanish struggle. There were Spanish exiles in Paris. There were Spanish exiles in England, uh, some of whom I think had probably just given in from exhaustion. 
but they were there, some of them still. And, and talking and listening to them were were great influences on one. You you couldn't ex, you know you couldn't chat to these people without realizing that what they'd seen, however corny it sounds now when you say it, and almost perhaps unbelievable, they touched something that perhaps people listening to this may never touch in their life. You know, they they, they touched something wonderful uh, as anarchists in Spain, which is why, of course. Sometimes I, I get too obsessed with Spain because there's so much to think about there, and there is that wonder that you you saw. I mean, we talk about anarchism all the time, and we talk about this, and we talk about mutual aid, and we talk about going and doing this and that, the other. But there, they did something far richer, far more potent. And whether we think it's relevant now or not. It's it's something that 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 when you met people who've been involved in it was truly quite potent and changed in a sense gave your your thinking a greater depth and a greater belief in 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 the possibilities of anarchism and also the need to challenge government at every opportunity. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm speaking with anarchist and historian Barry Pateman of the Kate Sharpley Library. Is that when you started getting into, I don't know how much you were into history when you were growing up and going to school, but was it meeting these folks that had been involved in a, in a struggle, you know, that was so active and potent some 30 years earlier that you started digging into history so deep? It certainly was a spur. It would have been strange if it wasn't. But it was also... In the 70s and 80s, talking to people like Albert Meltzer, who I, I think would be, it would be fair to say, though he'd probably laugh at me, has been a major influence in my life. Uh, for all, you know, I mean, Albert was a difficult man at times, I think, but I, I found him to be a man who carried history with him, who had a certain sense of what history should be, what anarchist history should be doing, and he was certainly a great influence on me. Uh, and then, of course, yes, Spanish anarchists. Um, you learn, you know, people like Stuart Christie, who, having been in prison in Spain for his attempt on Franco's life, had met anarchists there and came back with a fund of knowledge. And remember in 68 with the Carrera Conference, which I was just slightly young enough not to become aware of, there was this sense of this great emergence of a new anarchism, an exciting anarchism that went through Europe especially. And I'm, I'm saying this is still very European. Uh, and certainly in the 70s influenced quite a lot of people. And remember there were still people like Cipriano Mera alive who'd been key in the Spanish Civil War. There were people, you know, Antonio Tales with his histories of Sabati and others. And then, of course, the arrival of Miguel Garcia from prison, which the Black Cross managed, and his life and his writings began to affect quite a lot of us. And Miguel's sort of unknown heroes of the Spanish resistance, and we became, you know, Sabati people and all, all of this, uh, then led me to read a writer called Matt Cavanna, who'd done a sort of unknown anarchist for freedom in the 30s. Uh, he was an old Irish anarchist revolutionary, and he made me think very clearly about anarchism, or the history of anarchism. And it, 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 they all led me down a path that left me, I think, quite isolated for quite a long time. How so? Well, although I had, I mean, I, I, by isolated, I should say, I mean in terms of intellectual histories of anarchism and what anarchism is and was. Um, the Cake Shop Library, which we have now, and is in a sense our, our, our collective works on it regularly and works with it. Albert had been a great influence on the Cake Shop Library and helped enormously with it and was one of, if you like, it's, uh, if it wasn't an original founder, he was the energy that was there in the 80s. And I, I realized, that although I was interested in anarchist history, and I really was, what I thought was anarchist history wasn't the sort of material that was being written about in anarchist histories. 
And I, even now, I find myself trying to find it very difficult to locate what I think and the people around me in the Cape Sharpley Library think about anarchist history to, to what even good comradely scholars who are writing about anarchist history write about as anarchist history. Uh, and it's a, it's a difficult one for me. And But that, I'm not at all, I, I was thinking the other day when you start to bloody contact me whether I wanted to talk about this, because it may sound regretful, but it's not. I, I'm rather happy that I am where I am in my thinking about anarchist history. But I'm aware that for comrades like myself, it's a lonely business. I mean, what exactly is your vision of anarchist history and how does it well, differ from how other people well, are? I knew you were going to ask me Yeah, that. well, you just led into it. <laughs> I was thinking... What bastard asking me that? Um, <laughs> okay, I, I I think it's really looking at my own trajectory and looking at, say, the trajectory of, of other other people I've read about and learnt about over the years. Um, I, I will. I almost see anarchist history in, in two in two le- two strands. There's obviously the intellectual history of anarchism. You know, you can write saying it was in ancient Greece if you want, but you know, there's Bakunin, Kropotkin, Louis Michel, Goldman, you know, Kim Butchin, you know, whatever, whatever. And you can read that anarchism and say, well, you know, that's interesting. And I I think that's fine. I, it's not for me, but if comrades are doing that, that, that's as good as anything, you know. If you're clarifying what people meant and said, and why they said it at that particular time. That, that's good stuff. That's sort of like the canonical approach, right? Yes, yes, yes it is. But for me, I, I'm not even totally convinced in myself that a lot of anarchists bothered about that material. I mean, if you look, say, at Bakunin, in the 1880s, 1890s, I think probably a God and the State was available and probably nothing else to read in England, certainly. I, I rather think that anarchists almost did it themselves. They had a rough parameter which had been sort of oozed into the movement by people who had read Kropotkin, etc. But for, for most anarchists, it was like one foot forward, one foot back, one foot forward, one foot back. You learnt it together. You learnt what anarchism was together. You realized that you had shared feelings about certain things, but you learned how to progress together. And at times, I, I remain convinced that some anarchists had never read a word of Kropotkin in their life in 1890s. Uh, and so for me, those people were really interested because in a way, they were anarchism. Anarchism isn't, is it, just the, the works of Emma Goldman? or Voltaire declare, however wonderfully at times they write. Anarchism is if their ideas are adopted or even ignored. Anarchism is the, is the behavior of people, of anarchists. It's, it's what they do. It's their life experiences. Now, somewhere along the line, that if they ever read anarchism, they read that, and that, that it made sense to them. What they'd gone through in their life, the words they read made sense to them. But sometimes I would argue that that reading took place quite a while after they called themselves anarchists. And I don't think that, and I think anarchism is how men and women and children related to each other in certain situations. And really at times, and this is why I have to sound not too dramatic. I don't think Emma Goldman, Kropotkin, Murray Butchin, John Zertzan mean a toss at all. That there is almost, there's a study of anarchist theory, there's a study of anarchism. And sometimes the two are really divergent. My final point about all that, was, though, was, and this is where I got really, uh, if you like, challenged me a lot, was that I suddenly began to realise that if you were going to write a history of anarchism, you weren't going to write bloody Demanded the Impossible or whatever by Peter Marshall or Woodcock or Ruth Kinner. You had to write about ordinary people's lives who could call themselves anarchists because that was anarchism. You, you, you know, one of the things we decided, at the, it, really at the influence of Albert, but 
welcomed was that ordinary people, if you wanted to learn about the history of anarchism, you had to learn about the lives and the actions of people who didn't appear in the books. Because they were the anarchists who made any ideas happen, whether they read them or not. Anarchists were people who, who, who made things happen, who did things. And if you didn't know about them, you didn't know about anarchism. Certainly sometimes with the dialectic between the work, say, of Kropotkin or Bakunin or George Barrett and, and, and anarchist behavior in, in terms of people read it, bring their own ideas to it, change it slightly and do it. That's there. We can't ignore that. But it needs to be studied a lot more and it hasn't been. And, and secondly, there is, there is a, I think it's secondly, I've forgotten. But there is a, a, a belief, I have anyway, that anarchism is enriched, anarchist theory, if you want, is enriched by the behaviour of people who may not have read it but would call themselves anarchism. Anarchist, th anarchist theory is enriched by the nameless anarchists slaughtered in Franco's jails, murdered in Uruguay, wherever. It, it, that anarchism is a... Is, is that as much as Kropotkin, or probably more than Kropotkin. And, and that's a hard thing, I think, for us all to deal with. The, the anarchists who, you, you, you know, Albert Meltzer tells the story in his autobiography, I Couldn't Play Golden Angels, that the anarchists who, you know, the person who, uh, who influenced him most was a guy called Billy Campbell who died in World War Two. He was as anarchist as anybody was. But Billy Campbell, you and you, you and I knew nothing about Billy Campbell till Albert told us. So I think that my move towards anarchist history has gone off in a in a direction that other people haven't. There's also something else, which is an obsession about trying to get facts right as well and get rid of the myths in anarchism, which irritate me beyond belief, but that's by the by. So my overall trajectory is that by learning the lives of people, and respecting those lives, even if we disagree with their anarchist interpretations, by learning about those lives, what they went through, we learn about anarchism. And we learn far more about anarchism doing that than by reading, you know, Conquest of Bread. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I I really appreciate that take. Like when I was when I was coming up and, and studying, I took a lot from Howard Zinn's approach and like the the approach of looking at how not just from like a, a historical like big lens sort of view of how people lived in a society but the idea of fully rejecting the like big band theory of history and that we're all sort of like pawns by these genie like moved around by geniuses that yes that it's yes. it's what we're what we're experiencing that informs our choices and our relationships with each other i i fully agree it's also that seems like quite a dilemma for someone who's about recording history because in the, you know, those are exactly the people that are either buried, you know, you know, yes. buried under the leaves yes. or never yes. thought to, to write because they were so busy doing. Well, yes. I mean, Albert only, you know, he wrote regularly for war commentary and freedom, but a lot of people who he knew didn't write a word. Some of them couldn't, some of them were near illiterate. And finding those people and writing about their lives is a great joy. Talked uh, two years ago to Donald Room when I oh, was yeah. in the UK, yeah. and it was a, an absolute pleasure. And when I was trying to put the show up on the internet and put out notes, um, there were a bunch of names that he mentioned, of like, and this people, this person who was speaking in the square, and this person who like was an or like an agitator, and he his daughter went off to. Australia and he went to go join her and he never met her again and we never knew what happened to her like just these stories of people that for me I'm never going to know anything about a lot of the people that were mentioned who were amazing like inspirational speakers in Hyde Park and it's such a pity to to lose that even though it's it's losing it to me but so many other people like felt the impact and influence like that's that living energy is kind of that's anarchy right Yes, it is. And, and that energy is almost impossible sometimes to write about because that energy as well, of course, can lead to conflict and, and tension. But the influence of those people at certain times, I, I think it has never really been assessed and looked at. Yeah. And I think it's a great loss. I, I think it does. 
it does something to anarchism. It weakens anarchist history tremendously. Well, I mean, as long as we're also recognizing that it's a living thing that we're engaging in, that's you know, it's still it's still alive. It'd, it'd be lovely to have that. It'd be lovely to have a conversation with all the great anarchists throughout history who were never written about, but. Yeah, it would be. It would also probably be very infuriating and irritating <laughs> as well. And I think, yes, of course, it's a living entity. But the question really is, is what is our relationship now with our past as anarchists? Look, I'm not talking here about working class communities, uh, uh, communities of colour, whatever. I'm talking about anarchism. So that's for another discussion. But what is our relationship as anarchists? To the anarchist past uh, and I'm not sure I think there are all sorts of problems with that I mean I think every generation thinks they're new they're alive that past is past what we're facing now is so new and different and challenging that that you know it's just basically relevant yeah you know Bert Mum's okay yeah it's interesting to read the, a little bit about the Spanish women in the Sierras in the in the guerrilla war against Franco, but really it's not applicable anymore. And I think that that's a tension that's always going to be there for the anarchist historian because I don't want to be totally irrelevant. I'm happy to be 80% irrelevant, but when, it gets, when I'm 100% irrelevant, it makes me sulk. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm speaking with anarchist and historian Barry Pateman of the Kate Sharpley Library. Well, so you had mentioned uh, coming up on and being really influenced by the Anarchist Black Cross Bulletin and yeah, and yeah. like the presence of Stuart Christie and Albert Meltzer yeah. and um, that that really. So I was reading through this essay that you wrote for Bloodstained: A Hundred Years of Leninist Counter Revolution. It's entitled oh, "Cries yeah. in the Wilderness." You bring up stuff, don't you? Go on. <laughs> well, I mean, it wasn't published that long ago, but for me, that that like reading that was really inspirational because I. You know, I know bits about the history of Anarchist Black Cross, and I engage with an Anarchist Black Cross chapter and with other groups that do that work. And I think that not only is that work something that ties us to our history, knowing about people that have struggled and are continuing to be repressed, but getting to chat with you about this and your essay in there about Alexander Berkman and other anarchists' engagement with aid to incarcerated anarchists and social socialist revolutionaries and others under the Bolshevik regime is like, it's, it's fascinating to see a bit of that uh, heritage that those of us that do prisoner support are a part of and exist within. Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic period to study. And, and I think, you know, there's obviously some implications. I mean, that said, we have to be a little, I mean, I, you saw the tension in, in, I, I posed between some of the New York anarchists and Berkman and the New York anarchists saying, look, we should just be supporting our comrades, n- not other people. And, and Berkman was very adamant that, you know, in terms of the, 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 the Bolshevik slaughter, we will support people who are, who are also suffering under that. Now, Bertman, when he was in prison himself, in prison, you know, he wrote in prison memoirs of an anarchist. It's, it's a marvellous book. It, it's a very profound, I think, and uh, yeah, I think perhaps every, if you want to be an anarchist, just read that, because cause there's so much there, but there's so much that we would feel uneasy with now. Bertman had sympathy for all victims of capitalism. As far as Bertman was concerned, for instance, Capitalism was a malignant, brutal force. And to put people in prison for any crime they'd done was the height of barbarity, cruelty, and pointlessness. You know? And that that meant he had sympathy for crimes that you and I and our comrades now would blanch at. You know, as far as Berkman was concerned to some degree... And I say, as far as Burma was concerned, many people in those prisons who'd done, who had murdered, who had attacked women, those people were as worthy of sympathy as he was, because they were victims of the brutalities of capitalism. And and you know, if you 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 probably don't know that when he left that prison, the whole gallery stood up and clapped him as he walked out. All the prisoners in the prison. 
because of who he was and how he supported and helped them and been kind to them. Now, but that now may not, you know, that might cause problems if we look at that now in our thinking and how we see things. But Berkman was adamant that capitalism was a a malignant force. He also quickly went on to believe that Bolshevism was equally as malevolent. State socialism was as malevolent. And therefore, you would support people who normally you wouldn't cross the fucking street to say hello to because they too were being tortured and brutalized and hurt in, in Russian prisons. And therefore, to say, well, we should only worry about those people we know or believe to be similar to us was not acceptable. When the Anticlist White Cross restarted, at first it was a bit like, you know, the New York anarchists. We've got a lot of comrades in prison, let's help them. And it was mainly to help Spanish anarchists. And then it just took off, you know. Um, and it, it's a, it, it's a, it became a, a, a strange effect. You know, you, you find yourself supporting Marxist armed struggle people. In, in the, uh, because they had taken on capitalism and were suffering in mightily in capitalist prisons. You couldn't quite abandon them because everyone else had. A lot of other people had and the anarchist Black Cross didn't. That said, you went down some strange pathways, which I wish we hadn't gone down. Uh, the last time I was at the Kate Sharpley at Christmas, and there's a folder there with, with uh, oh, God, I, a couple of letters from the Manson women, you know, mm. to the Black Cross asking for help. And he, yeah, yeah, that's complicated. Was, what are we fucking going to do about that? I don't fucking know. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, the point is that you, you will support people who are victims of capitalism. But there has, if you do that, you then perhaps have to consider it's not just the political people who are victims of capitalism who you're supporting as the Black Cross. There are social prisoners right through America. And, and social prisoners who've done crimes that you and I might be horrified by, but in their own way are victims of capitalism. It's a great moral massive dilemma that, that Berkman tried to deal with as steadily and conscientiously as he could. And believe me, the work Berkman did was fucking only work supporting the Russians, prisoners, you know, the anarchists in prison, the socialist revolutionists. You just, just, you know, a, a desk full of bits of scraps of paper, news coming four, four months after, six months after that it had happened. And that, that great dedication. I, I'm telling you, that's, that's one of the, the most heroic things that man did. Never mind, you know, you want to see him as a person who killed Frick or this, that, the other. He sat at that desk with and helped by lots of people in Germany and elsewhere. And they sat down and they tried to get publicity and support for people who were going through hell, a hell that we couldn't believe. It was a wonderful, wonderful piece of selflessness, which I think, uh, I don't know if we've re really recognised enough. So, Bertman, great man, but his, some of his views would worry about that. It doesn't mean that he was wrong or right, but sometimes our, our culture changes. Anarchists in history maybe don't. But what we can't do, and what we should never fucking do, is to treat those fucking anarchists of his, of his, in history as little pieces of chess pawns to support our arguments now. We can't fill it, Emma Goldman's life, and just say, well, she said this once, and that's, that means we're right if I say that and I put that fucking quote in. We can't say, here are our worries of today. This is what we're challenging. Let me go and find a quote to see what Berkman said. Let me go and see and find a quote what John Moe said. Let me go and find a quote what Galliani said, and I can use that as an argument. Those people are actually worth more than that, you know? They're worth far more than that, that fucking awful historical approach. And yes, they'd have awkward, horrible ideas at times because they were a product of their time, as anyone was. But they rose above it as well as they could. And you have to see those people as people, not, not as just intellectual ciphers to let you win a fucking argument on Facebook. They're, they're people who lived lives were contradictory, were awkward, were difficult. 
But we have to respect their life because if we can't respect anarchist lives and, and their complexities, what are we doing? It's just like the Stalinist approach to history. I'm going to ignore that because I don't like it. It doesn't fit my PhD thesis. Oh, fuck off. Kind of jumping topics a little bit. You mentioned in the introduction to that ar- that article that you've seen a lot of people, and, and all of us have seen a lot of people that have been embracing, very young people embracing authoritarian communism or some version or some patina of it. Why do you think that is? <sighs> because... You have to be quite careful now. I think, first of all, there's always going to be a revisionist of history. They're always going to look at history and try and suggest that there's something that we've missed there that we could use. And therefore, they want to look at Maoism. They want to look at uh, Trotskyism, and they, they want to find things. Secondly, there is a distinct historical tradition they can feel part of. And thirdly, it's actually quite easy. Because although you're grappling with these ideas, there are people around you giving you the answers. And that you can use the writings of Trotsky, you can use the writings of people who followed on, Shackman and other people, you can follow those people and you can get the answer that you want or refine their arguments to fit now. And you really, really feel part of something and you feel part of a movement and you don't feel alone. And I think that's ever so important for a lot of people. And my my final cynical thing would be is that you know it's often an intellectual exercise it's often something that you can do and 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 make sense of remember when i first grew grew up i first grew up i I still haven't finished yet but when i did initially (laughs) things like marxism trotskyism anarchist even that you join those movements because you felt that they explained the world that you, all the answers to the fucking world's problems were in those movements, if you looked at them carefully enough, if you looked at the writings. And, and you know, be it religion, be it famine, be it relationships with each other, you look there to find the answers, and it gave you the answers. Uh, um, uh, I think people feel a need to do that and find that even now. Do you think that there's a point of intercession that anarchists can make in that seeking of, I mean, not, there's obviously huge differences between someone who's, you know, uh, into Enver Hoxha or whatever, because they read the Wikipedia page and they found a bunch of translated articles. But like, if, if there's a commonality of leftism between the folks who are intellectually into Mao or Stalin or whatever, and people that come from an anarchist tradition is, is there actually enough of a foundation, enough dirt to plant roots into and engage with? Or should we just like at least try to say it's okay? Like, I, I don't know. Like, is, is there is there grounds for communication, do you think? Well, I don't think AK called that book Bloodstained for nothing. You know, yeah. if you look at our movement, you look at anarchist history, more as many anarchists have been slaughtered by communists and trotskyists if you want but communists certainly as have been been slaughtered by fascists and capitalists we have to accept that you'd be would be naive not to you know we can't count the dead in russia can't count the dead in bulgaria you know or elsewhere we really can't they have blood on their hands our blood on their hands and never mind the whole viciousness in Spain and the, the killing of something richly possible. I'm not sure we can just ignore that. I, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is, you know, what are there common threads in, in, in anarchist history that, that we can look at? And here I'm not doing the historical approach of saying that's important now. I'm trying to look and say, do I see themes right through it? And one of the themes that we have is who do we work with to get rid of capitalism? I'll talk about that in a little while, capitalism, but who do we work with? And I, I'm old now, but I don't think I can think of many times when communists haven't betrayed anarchists. You know, I really don't. And it may well be that these new 
youth who are moving into communist ideas and whatever, you know, are, are nice, interested people. But suddenly, if a revolution situation came around, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near them. Because I think in their ideologies, there is uh, an authoritarianism that, that I haven't seen yet dismissed. I've seen a lot of interest in ideas and discussions, but I haven't seen that dismissed. And I, I mean, it may well be that the next generation of anarchists is really less cynical than, you know, what's the word, mis you know, <laughs> misanthropic than I am. But those bastards have got a lot of blood on their hands. And I, I'm i not that yet got to the stage where I can just forget that. It may be that, you know, your generation and people around you can. And that may be a good thing. Who knows? But all I would say is watch him. Yeah, if nothing else, there's a lot of there's a lot of recent history of entryism, or at least in the last 20 years of of movements and organizations that share space between authoritarian Marxists and anyone else, honestly. Mm. So, yeah. bad habits. Yes. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm speaking with anarchist and historian Barry Pateman of the Kate Sharpley Library. So, I, I'd like to talk a little more about Kate Sharpley Library. Can you talk about that project, how it came about, and sort of how, what it does? Well, we have a web page, first of all. Which just put Kate Sharpley in, in into web and it'll turn up, so that will help people. But it began really uh, as a, an idea of a few people just to collect material, and then I think Albert introduced the name Kate Sharpley because Kate Sharpley was a a young woman who no one really knew anything about. Albert had met her when she was an older woman. And uh, she had thrown a medal back at a relative of the royal family. You know, when you were uh, when a, when a member of your family was killed in World War One, uh, mm. you were presented with a medal. You know, we said he died for king and country, and it's it, quite a lot. Of many households in England have them, and it was some relative of the royal family who, who presented her with a. a, a, a Medal because I think her brother or someone had been killed, and she just picked it and threw it back at her and said, I don't want your stinking medal. And she was, you know, branded as a traitor and was called, I think, a prostitute at times. And it seemed to Albert that that was a good name for this library because what he wanted this library to do and other people around wanted to do was not just to have the memories of all the big names, you know the letters of Kropotkin, a few original letters, but we wanted to try and remember and learn about all the people who were not the names of anarchism, who were, who had struggled and suffered often emotionally and physically for their belief and, and, and were unrecorded now anywhere. And it, it, it gradually took off and I started to work with it in the, uh, I think, early 90s. So it's nearly 30 years of, of, of graph with it. And our, our aim is still that. We produce a bulletin probably every quarter. We publish pamphlets. We, we sometimes go down obscure alleyways for, for hours and days and months and find nothing. And other times we do. But our aim is simply just to record the history of those people who have, have been forgotten. Right. And that leads us into some areas of, you know, tension. There are some anarchists who want to forget this, that, and the other, and, and we don't forget anything. We try to bring ideas and people back to life. We want, you know, we want to at least, if 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 there's nothing else, you know, and we're not bringing them back to life so we can, quote, unquote, learn from them. We're bringing them back to life to say, look, you know, these people had our ideas or most of our ideas. They had most of our beliefs and they were fucking slaughtered for it. Or they went into despair and walked away from the movement because they couldn't stand it anymore. Or they went to drink or they just left the bloody country. But we want to recognize them for what they did. End of story. And we want to recognize them for what they suffered 
end of story. And we want to say that they're not forgotten. No matter whatever else happens, they're not forgotten. There's one little part of the world where they are alive still. Because if you don't do that as an anarchist, you know, what, what are you talking about anarchism there for? If you can't remember all of your comrades who went through shit and, and, and despair and, 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 you know, ecstasy and happiness, if you can't remember all those people with all those feelings, what a dry, boring movement you've got. And one that's not based in any type of reality. I I have experienced this over the 40 some years that I've been alive I it strikes me and this is a conversation that I have a lot with comrades that are younger than me of just how much it seems that people leave movement and people walk away from anarchism we lose our comrades and we lose these connections and I know that like capitalism is a hell of a fucking system to live under and survive and keep ourselves sane let alone struggle on top of working all the time to be able to make ends meet. But do you have any observations about what, what sort of things have helped you to stay committed to being an anarchist or, or ways that communities can, can hold together better to support people through those hard times? Um, I I really want to give you some really clever answer that, that would make it all, clear and straightforward but i don't know if i can and if it sounds wobbly it's simply because what i'm thinking about now all the time as you get older i'm sure it may not quite your age but you begin to think more and more about those sort of questions um i think sometimes one stays an anarchist out of sheer bloody mindedness but i have to say that you know learning about people who I never knew about, seeing them and learning of their lives and and their feelings and their emotions has certainly given for me inspiration, okay? It gives me an inspiration. And sometimes, I'm afraid, it gives me more inspiration than perhaps some of the stuff we're doing now as anarchists. That is not meant to demean anarchists but i actually think that at times we're very much an online movement and i really can't be bothered with that i'll come back to that later if i may in terms of communities and defeat i don't know you know 30 years ago it was a glib argument that look if you take part in this strike if you take part in this tenants movement if you take part in this rent strike and you lose you've learned a lot you know, you've learned a lot and you will use that knowledge to inform the next struggle you're in. I, I'm not sure that's true anymore. I think the experience of defeat for people who are not anarchists and people who aren't already totally committed, the experience of defeat in, in some cases can be devastating. And I'm not sure we've ever learned that. I think that sometimes... Um, you know, as you see the communities broken up around you, that that community that gave you some support and strength, however awkward and, and messy, when you see that, I'm not convinced that you're learning anything from defeat. And And if you wanted to be quite cynical, there's a lot of defeat in our movement and a lot of defeat in the political struggle around us. I think there's some marvellous things going on in some communities of care and love and, and, and trying to support each other. But I think in, in some communities that have taken on the state and have been knocked about a bit, I don't know whether or not, you know, what we're learning from that, I don't, I'm not sure. So what, what do I say? I say that we're not apparatchiks. I don't, I think, you see, part of the problem is that we're not located in communities. We're not located amongst people who think totally differently from us. And if we are, we don't like them. We make our anarchist ideals the most important thing in the world. And if people don't agree with those ideals or don't understand those ideals, we're in trouble. Because they just say, okay, and yes, there'll be a strike and we'll support them. We'll print all their papers, we'll print this, we'll print that. But when the strike goes away, if we're not living in that community, we move on to our next thing, don't we? What's next then? 
Well, miners, I know, I know print workers. Oh, I, oh, I know this community there. They can just keep moving around like fucking blowflies. And it's not helping anybody. My other point might be, my worry would be, and it's a question I keep asking myself all the time. And by the way, sorry, I should go back. I don't think you can just invent organic communities again. And I'm not sure I've got the skills to say, well, this is, we haven't got those mining communities. We haven't got those agricultural communities. We haven't got those fishing communities anymore. They've all fucking gone. So I, I haven't got the skill to realize what community we have now. But I do know, I think I do sense that we do not yet, or we haven't yet developed the ability to talk to people who aren't anarchists. We haven't found the language to do that. Whilst in history, they had. And it's, it seems to be one of the biggest questions that we face now as a How do we talk about our ideas to those people who think we're fucking stupid or have got no interest in politics whatsoever, as 90% of the world hasn't? You know, they're not really totally interested in us. And, and how do we talk to them? Now, we've always said that you learn through struggle. Well, sometimes you do, and you learn not to do that fucking thing again. When you look at people like Vanzetti, and when you look at you know people like Frank Kitt, so these just names I'm giving you now, they could communicate with people who were poor, who mocked politics, and had no time whatsoever for any political strand. But they could talk to them. They had that language. I'm not sure we've got it anymore. And I think until we find that language, we could always end up just, you know, being honest on Facebook with each other or with each other in real life. We have to face that we will have to talk to people who have got attitudes that we're not easy with. But, you know, don't, don't we all realize that's how anarchism grew by entering into those discussions. Uh, but, that's another point. So I'm not sure I could answer that question clearly, because if I could, I'd be I'd be happy as Larry. All I would finish with is that <laughs> Albert Meltzer and others who I knew of his age group would always say, well, I never gave up. I never gave up. And often it was sheer bloody-minded mental strength and a desire to get rid of capitalism that kept them going. That reminds me of a Chumbawamba song. Ah, well, that's where they got the title from. <laughs> it's true I believe it anyway. here's Chumbawamba with a live rendition of I Never Gave Up off the album Show Business
I never gave up. I crawled in the mud, but I never gave up. I never gave up. I never gave up. I crawled in the mud, but I never gave up. I never gave up. I never gave up. I crawled in the mud, but I never gave up. I never gave up. I never gave up. I crawled in the mud, but I never gave up. I never gave up. I never gave up. I crawled in the mud, but I never gave up. I never gave up. I never gave up. I crawled in the mud, but I never gave up. I never gave up. I never gave up. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm speaking with anarchist and historian Barry Pateman of the Kate Sharpley Library. So, yeah, you've, you've, I think you've touched on something right there, and I think that, and I don't know, this is this is me being Pollyanna-ish or whatever, but as we're talking right now, we are in the midst of a global pandemic, yes. and uh, we are also on the slow precipice of ecological collapse. And, yeah. And I wonder if, maybe I watch too many Hollywood movies, but I wonder if this is not the opportunity in some ways that we can take. There's been a lot of chatter about communities coming together and, and forming, talking about rent strikes because whole portions of the economy, whole apartment buildings, whole cities are going to be unable to pay mortgages, to be able to pay oh, rent. Sure. Uh, people have to scramble. Those like people hoarded food or, or even just bought up supplies if they could, but there's tons of people in our communities that don't. And healthcare and environment are two things that both... Yeah, they they sort of like in some ways cross class divisions and community divisions, um, but they they're so all encompassing. Another way of putting it is not just that like everyone has a concern with it, but literally everyone's concern needs to be our concern if we're going to survive. I wonder if there's any any examples of community organizing that you've seen that inspire you, or any lessons that you think that we might think about through this like very very harrowing time well i think that if one is to believe facebook and i hope one's right here there are lots of anarchists and sympathizers going out there and people who are anarchists created mutual aid groups who are trying to help people and to support people at this time and i think that is exemplary uh, and i think if nothing else you gain you know people begin to see who you are and what you believe and this is what you're doing and i and i can't urge people you know to to keep doing that to help people to care for people around you it's especially difficult because i think that when i grew up as i said if you knew a lots of people in your area it wasn't hard to do that you know it is now i think many of us don't speak to our next door neighbors particularly or the person in down the corridor in our block so if nothing else, it's opening up and breaking down a few barriers. In terms of, I, I, I would like to see this as a time that will lead to some type of radical, permanent, real societal change. Um, but what that change will be is going to be a really tricky question. Because I... I think that to some degree we are living in unreal times, although the Spanish flu in 1918 and the reactions of anarchists to that might be an interesting one to look at. I think that the solution that capitalism has, which is to lock you away in your house and good luck to you there, you know, and we'll come back in four weeks and everything will be better and we're going to give some money to businesses and, you know, I see some, I think France has said don't pay rent and in New Zealand, they're saying, don't pay your mortgage, don't worry about that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Capitalism, and, and I, I want to come back to this, because this is what I've been looking at now for the last three years, which is the question, surely, that anarchists have asked since anarchists were alive ever, was how do you get rid 
capitalism. How do you, you know, finish it off? Will it be a pandemic? Will it be its own destruction? Will it be some great bank flow, fall over or something? How do we get rid of capitalism? And at the moment, we're expecting a virus to do it for us. But the question is, what will we put in its place should that ever happen? And in what ways are you and I and all of our comrades not damaged by capitalism still? How do we stop and avoid the damage that capitalism has done to us as people? Because let's be clear, there's not one fucking anarchist in this world who in some way has not been damaged by that malignant system, that sinewily brutal and hard system, is there? So there are big questions to ask, but if there's opportunities, that one has to take them. But one has to take them on the basis of mutual aid, mutual care and help. It may be an exciting time because one of the other things that I worry about a lot and think about a lot is that, you know, we will need a lot of people to support us, to help us and work with us. We will need those people. We don't want to form a fucking little elitist Bolshevik government. We will need the mass of people to be with us, okay? What are you going to do if not start shooting them? You know, I don't care, you know, as long as there is a majority of people who feel that the ideas that are being put forward of getting rid of capitalism, producing something far more humane in its way, if there's a majority of people, I think that's a wonderful thing. How we get that majority is a tricky, gnarly question. And one, I think, that goes back to how we talk to people. How we talk to people beyond the mere, you know, this is an emergency. How do we talk to people beyond that? And there are questions I, I'm not qualified to answer, but I worry about every fucking morning I wake up. Yeah, this is the world that we have to share with them. Yeah. Or we have to find some sort of balance and some, some sort of way to come to mutual agreement to find something better than this, because yes. this is literally killing yes, it us. Is. It, it is, and it, and it will eventually. And even if this pandemic flies by, and, and, you know, we find in, 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 I don't know, November or something that we're all wandering around like eyes wide open, lost. The economy will be in crisis and it will be a great opportunity to present people with the potential of something far more humane, far more civilized and far better for mental, physical and emotional well-being. Whether we as anarchists have got the skill and the abilities to do that, is, is another matter. Yeah. Well, I mean, the alternative that a lot of people are fearing is that this will be an opportunity for increased ethno-nationalism, stronger borders, more, more somehow more intense capitalism, and the, the normalization of, of, of people basically living under military rule. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's a great fear. And it's always there. It's always there, not just in pandemics, but it's always there in times of social turmoil, social strife. It's always there. And one of the, the things that uh, is, I keep coming back to this point because it, it, it drives me rather crazy is that we can't be self-righteous about our beliefs here. We can't say that we're the answers. And if you don't agree totally with this, you're fucking stupid, you know. You either want to be able to explain the possibilities that are there that will oppose a militarized state. You want to explain the possibilities to say, look, you know, we can all care for each other. What we can't do is dress up as fucking old punks and think that unless people look like I do, they're not really part of our movement. We have to accept the fact that when anarchism has been strong, it's had grandmothers, granddads, and two-year-olds who are all sympathetic to anarchism. Even the two-year-olds are in the households when they go to the socials. If you look at the socials in Spain, the, it, it was multi-age. It was multi-group. You know, there'd be people who were 18, people who were four there. Your grandma went, your granddad went. You know, the, 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 they are as rich and as full of potential as anyone. We have to get be able to, to take our attention away from talking to each other and to talk to people out there in that scary world beyond the computer screen. And maybe this awful pandemic 
And I don't want to even say it's given us a chance to do that because it's almost a disparaging of the people whose lives are lost and the, the misery and sadness in families. But, you know, it might encourage us to talk to people more. It might. And if that's the case, that will be a great step forward, I think, in not to talk to each other, but to talk to people out there. That's all I can think about, really, at the moment. So is there anything you can learn from anarchist history apart from lives? Yeah, I think there is. And and this is, a, I suppose, where, where one gets at a certain stage in one's thinking, and I'm at there now. And I think there were certain, and there are certain things that are relevant to it. You know, which I think we have to accept that these are relevant to us and that sometimes we can read about what anarchists try to do with it, not at all to copy it, but to realise that it's a relevant theme that we haven't yet dealt with and we haven't been able to solve or we haven't been able to quite come to terms with. And I suppose the the, the first one, of course, and, and it's it's in every piece of anarchist writing and anarchist action, which is... How do we get rid of capitalism? I mean, if you'd have said to me in 1968, 69, that capitalism would still be functioning in 2020, I'd have probably laughed at you. Uh, I thought that capitalism was on its way out, yet every time it's managed to come back from whatever challenge. And it's proved to be sinewy, it's proved to be difficult, it's proved to be elusive to pin down. It may be that the era that we're living in will change all of that. But, you know, I am slightly cynical because it's, it's been thrown at us, you know, many, many times that it's on its last legs. And that little weaselly bastard keeps coming back. So, you know, for the anarchists, say, in the Socialist League of England, the anarchists around Mother Earth, that was in America, the, the anarchists around, the sorry, the anarchists in Argentina, Giovanni and others, how do you get rid of capitalism? How does it go? Because if you don't get rid of capitalism, anarchism will never live. And, and alongside that, of course, is what does it mean to be an anarchist under capitalist society? What does it mean? How how far can you should you go in your want accommodation? These are real problems that with, with capital, your accommodation with capitalism, I should say. These are real problems that anarchists have agonised over for a hundred years. In the American anarchist, anarchist communist paper, Free Society, there was whole discussions about this in the eighteen ninety nine nineteen hundreds. What do we do with capitalism as anarchists? How, how can we relate to it? Well, say, if you look at Bono gang in Ram, Raymond Kellerman, or Raymond Le Science, as he was called, those people felt, and those comrades felt very clearly that there was no accommodation to be had. Better to throw yourself against it and, and die than try and compromise with it. You had to leave a completely separate life, but at the same time become a legalist to challenge its morality. There's, there's all sorts of approaches you could have. But but the, the truth is, how do we, how do you and I function as anarchists in a capitalist world? And if you can't function properly, then what's the fucking problem with capitalists? If you can go and live on a little fucking commune in you know some part of America and not really get bothered by it, well, you know, capitalism's fine, right? So that tension of being an anarchist under capitalism has permeated right through anarchist history. And, and it's a real challenge for us to deal with. So that, that, I think, is really, really quite important. As I said earlier, talking about bloodstained, the next question in terms of capitalism is who do we work with to get rid of it? You know, Who do we work with who we feel we can trust and would share the ideas of a world afterwards based on mutual aid and individual respect? Who do we feel we can work with to achieve that aim. And once it's gone, to work for this much better world. And, and that seems to me an enormously important question nowadays. And it may well be that we move away from traditional ideas of left thinking and go to people who are not necessarily political, but are, are perhaps rich in, in emotion and possibility. I, I don't know. But I don't think that whatever happens 
we cannot bring anarchy around if that's what we really want. And if we don't, just, well, you can go and fucking watch the TV or write brilliant, witty pieces on on Facebook. Um, if we want to get rid of that and we want to bring anarchy around, we have to have a lot of people with us. We know that. We're not Bolsheviks. We're not going to have a dictatorship. And that's the challenge of uh, of creating that movement through education and discussion under capitalism. And I think, again, you you can see that right through history. Can I also, anarchist history, anyway, can I say that the group that really got them perhaps more effectively than most was the Senate, which is why it's always worth looking at. There's a couple of other things, and then I'll let your readers go away and enjoy their life. <laughs> The question really is, and it's following on from that, is to do with organization. Are we able to create organizations that are flexible, fluid, non-dogmatic enough to challenge capitalism and to to be faithful to the complexities, if you like, of anarchist practice and relationships? Can we do that? It's bloody hard, and I don't know if we can. But we may need to work with other anarchists and other people in those organizations. And how do we do it? You know, we can, I mean, there's been a great tradition of non-organizational anarchists who've added much to our movement. There's no question of that. But at the same time, how, how do we possibly create groups and organizations that can truly bring in thousands upon thousands of people with us to break capitalism. And how can we make them honest and in conjunction with our belief? And my final question is a little bit trickier. And all these things I'm working on, so if you think you've got the fucking answers, you're wrong. All I'm saying is you can look through anarchist history and see all of those points, clear as daylight being discussed again and again and again and practiced again and again and again and the other point i would say is that we do have to look at the role of class in anarchism now you know I, I, you can argue all day long about the role of the working class blah 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 and whether they're going to you know are they the agent that we should be worrying about in terms of social change yeah i, I think probably if only because there's a lot of them uh, but, you know, we are also aware, aren't we, that many anarchists turn to what you and I would call, what we all would call the, the poor. The poor in anarchist thinking was often different from the working class. The poor was often the lump and proletariat, the people who had no organization, were unemployed and such. And, and, and actually, anarchists often make great strides in that group. You know, one of the most poignant uh, documents I've ever read is A Day Mournful and Overcast, which was the memoir of an ex prisoner who'd been, the, the anarchists had gone in and smashed down the jails and brought him out, and he'd gone to fight with the iron column. And here is this man at last finding a dignity in his life that being a prisoner never had. He wasn't an anarcho syndicalist, he hadn't been in any trade union, he was a prisoner. And those people. Now, that, that whole group is growing and growing in our culture. And we do have to find ways of speaking to them and talking to them and supporting them. And we may need to challenge what our own thinking about that. But examples of people going to them is throughout history. You, Frank Kitts in the 18, I think it was 1891, was talking about the great mass of unemployed and poor in London who anarchists had to get to. And he called it tickling the elephant. He said, we haven't even begun to tickle the elephant yet in the room. We haven't done it. Yet these people are the, by far the mass of people in the poor working areas or the poor working class areas, however you want to describe them. So how we deal with those people, how we actually work and communicate with people in that position, sometimes out of their choice, sometimes not out of their choice is a critical factor. But one other thing is there's the role of class in the anarchist movement. And anarchism has been written about often by clever middle-class people who've been to university or college or whatever and can write well. 
And you can see that even now on Facebook. There's a certain style of writing on Facebook I can't do. People ask me a question, oh, fuck me, I don't know. It'll take me about five hours to write a reply to it. Other people can be clagging away because that's what they do. They're good, they're clever, they can do that. They're not, you know, one of the things we have to accept is that it's nice they can do that. But there might be just as many riches and just as much potential and just a little different views on life from people who aren't that able, who aren't that good at writing, who aren't that good at expressing themselves. No one told me that you had to be a fucking graduate to be an anarchist or to be able to write well. I'd rather have an anarchist who, who, who had something in their chest and their heart she did or he did. And I think we have to be very careful that one of the things the internet has done is to privilege those people even more. And that's a danger for us. We want to be all embracing, and we don't want clever buggers writing things very easily. Well, and it may be brilliant what they're writing. It might be, but it's exclusory as much as anything else is. It's an exclusionary process because Facebook has no time for the business. Well, uh, uh, you know, you, you've all, we've all had conversations with people who find it hard to express ideas. But when they do, you realize there's a richness there that's worth treasuring. Now, all those things, I think, you can find in anarchist history. You can see the study of anarchism, if we're not careful, is going to be about those people who just wrote for anarchist newspapers in 1932. Those people who could write. Those people who are good editors. Those people who could get an idea and play with it and run with it. But there were also, beyond them, under, around them, people who couldn't write well. People who didn't have that skill. But they were as just as much an anarchist and had just as much their own idea and sometimes richer ideas in their own way than the people who were writing. And we have to be careful about that. Because because even in many of the more the newer movements, if you like, we're privileging people who can write, people who can speak well. And that's a real danger to me. And I think that if you look at anarchist history, one of the things that the up is trying to do is to go beyond that. To say, yeah, look, you know, that article there is really clever. It's good. It's really interesting and very powerful and very potent and speaks. But what about the people who can't write that well? Are they just sitting there going, oh, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful article, Emma. No, sometimes they've got their own ideas. That there are either a reaction to that article or is slightly different. And, and they're the people that we have to find now, as well as in history. So all those themes I've just outlined in that sort of garbled way, you can find in any country, in any anarchist movement in the world, from the, the times it began. And they're still there now. And there's still questions and problems that we have to to. to to come and deal with and to work with. And we haven't solved them. We haven't got an answer for them yet. We haven't got uh, anything like it. And for some of us, it's still the burning questions. I think unless, and in, unless we can come to terms with a lot of these, then the chances of us really achieving anarchy in the next few years are going to be quite limited. Um. One of the things I will finish off is it's great to talk to each other. As I say, go out and talk to other people. I think you're a bit deaf. Thanks for your time, though. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm speaking with anarchist and historian Barry Pateman of the Kate Sharpley Library. Actually, on that last point that you were making, like I, th I think I think that's a very, very poignant thing to point out, and that's something that I I, I also think about is there's the you know there's an essay that was written in the '70s, the tyranny of structurelessness. Yeah, yeah. I think that, like, actually, at first read, I was just like, "Bah, whatever." Like, but, but there's so much, there's so much power that people wield without. Like in America, a class analysis is something that we've adapted and taken over from other countries, where it's it's more clearly delineated historically, and you have this like thing that you can point to. In America, there's so many parts of the mythology, and you know, the occasional case of like rags to riches stories, but there's not really much of a it's 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 hard to point to the difficulty of how some people take power in collective situations and how we allow that to happen and also how that person 
takes advantage of of that power that they have and what's lost because that power is taken and i i wonder if there's are there any instances that you can think of where groups have had that you've read about where groups have developed good mechanisms for sort of like checking that and being like uh you've been talking for a little bit like I've heard about, but that historically, like human communities have used and continue to use shame as a way of knocking people down when they've garnered a lot of social capital or, you know, they have an advantage over other people because it's not about them as individuals in the community. It's about their life is about them for sure, but it's about them within the collective and within the world that they exist in as a part of it, not above it. Well, I think it's a common problem in anarchist groupings and in anarchism anyway. Um, if Rudolf Rocker said something, people would listen to him a lot more than if Billy Smith said something or John Brown. Even if what Rudolf said may be silly, which I'm not saying it was, status is, is inferred on people in anarchism as any other movement. No matter how people would pretend it's not, it is. I grew up and I'd listen to certain people and be impressed by them uh, a bit more than other people. I mean, you, you you would be a bit weird listening to, say, Cipriano Mira, who'd been in Spain and then uh, been imprisoned and eventually got out, was living in, in poor conditions in France, but was still a, a, an interesting, fascinating guy. Actually, he never really abused that. But we have given status to people in our movement uh, when we shouldn't have. Men and women, we have given status to that. Now, how you pull that down is quite a tricky one. How you create a movement where people who are not articulate, people who are not confident, people who left school when they were 15, people who uh, feel slightly unease and in awe of the people around them, how you give them confidence, I think, has really been very difficult for anarchists. And I think that and, and and you know we can go beyond that to to all genders and cultures in in anarchism. We found it very difficult, and I think that's still the case. And I think that the only cultures or only group I know that attempted that, but that was a very monocultural one, was the Sanité. And you might question very much in in the early days its attitude, say to mujer libres and the, the women militants there. That perfect balance is something that we're still struggling for. We're still trying to find those those discussions where everyone is equal. And you, you, which is why I I, I stop going to a lot of meetings because because you you tend to know a bit. You don't want to sit there and say we fucking said that thirty years ago. You know, never happened. You 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 let people carry on and and learn themselves, but. I can honestly say that I've struggled to find to think of any grouping that has that has been as fair, equal, and open as I would like in anarchism. But I don't think it's too late. I think we're all learning and we're trying better. But you can see that in you know from the 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 fact that say in <laughs> Groups around were often created by men. You you will often find they're often created by rather articulate men, or they were created by articulate women in the case of freedom in England. And, you know, people who weren't articulate were, were, were not there. And, and that seems to me a massive, massive challenge to us all as anarchists. And what I, I'm glad, I, you know, I, I may be too old to actually accept that challenge, but I do want to urge it. If you look at anarchist history, you can see that so clearly that anarchists eventually lose the ability to speak to people or it becomes almost like a fucking, you know, a university classroom. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing we want at this time. It's the last, and it's, uh, we've never wanted. And you can see people, anarchists, Joe Lane and others in England, and it's what I know most, bridling at this, you know, and, and, and often leaving because of it. I was really hoping that you had the answer. <laughs> Fuck me. This Do you is... think I'd, I've been waiting for years. I uh, want my money I back. 
I, I think that th there's going to have to be such a culture change in terms of who we are writing for and who we are talking to at the moment. Anarchism has got itself in a certain position, which there may be really good social and economic reasons for it, where a lot of anarchists just talk to themselves. And we need, and I've said it again and again in this discussion, we need to find the language to, to speak to people who think we're silly or I think we've got nothing to say to them, who literally do things that we find reprehensible or say things we find reprehensible. We need to engage a lot of those people in the conversation. And if it fails, it fails, but we have to give it that conversation. And, you know, if those people decide that anarchism has some richness for them, when they come into our movement, they are as important as the most articulate man or woman in that room. They are as important. And, and they have to be in some way made to be welcoming. I told a story for a few years. After the miners' strike in 85, there were a couple of apprentices who came up to us who'd been quite happy and, and, and pleased and, and respectful of the work that anarchists had done to support them in their strike. Okay? Mm -hmm. They really were. They, they, you know, we'd, I think, behaved bloody well and put hours and hours into the strike without telling people what to do, but just offering support and being there with them on the lines. So they came along and they wanted to join, you know, an anarchist group. And they had in their pockets, open at page three, the Sun newspaper. And the Sun newspaper had, in those days, a picture of a, a rather, you know, usually a woman showing her breasts. And it was like the page three pinup page. And they were reading the Sun, which was about as an anathema to, to, to their struggle as any you could ever find. The Sun thought they were all and they didn't want them to get involved in it. That's by the by. What they wanted was to to join, to be part of our movement. Now, the question was that very few people they spoke to could help them in that. You know that? They couldn't. And they couldn't do it because how do you open a discussion with someone and read the paper that is totally opposed to what you stand for and has pictures of naked women in Tawogel? Like, they're, you know, how can you do that? And Slowly, the, the, I guess. The fact is, these guys wanted to be part of us because, you know, for, for whatever reason, they felt we'd done good stuff. Now, do we say, no, you know, we can't, we, you're just out of the door. You know, we can't have you. You're going to have to go away and learn to be a better human fucking being or something before you can join anarchism. And the truth is, surely, that we're not a cult, are we? We're not a cult whereby only the best can join. And you can see that as a culture right through anarchist history. And th that type of approach that, that you have to be thinking just like we do before you can become part of us is, is both at times necessary if you're engaged in underground work, if you're engaged like the FI were, or you're engaged in the armed struggle movement, but if you're in a mass movement that's trying to grow and grow and grow, well, you have to think about things like that. It doesn't mean that you have to take that. It doesn't mean at all that they should do. But, but people are not going to think like we do. What are we going to do about that? It's a question mark. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a question mark that we, we, we've had trouble with for years and years, and all anarchist movements have. You know, there's a sense of... Uh, the, the the point that we're facing is that we believe anarchism is the richest possibility. It's it's a possibility for for the majority of people in this world or a lot of people in this world to find a richness and strength within them, to find that potential in them, that, that, that possibility in them that has denied them under any other system. It could be a flowering of enormous, enormous richness for humanity in the world in the next thousands of years. The, the, the question is, how are we going to approach people who aren't like us and convince them that this idea, this possibility is one that we, they should join and be with? You know, that, that they can see that possibility and that they should be with us on that journey. 
And that that's the biggest question that you see throughout, I think, anarchist history, as well as how to get out of capitalism. How does an anarchist movement grow? How does it grow into a rich, to, to, to bring this about? Always been the question. And, you know, if there's one thing that Bolshevism taught us, is don't do it that way. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but that then opens up, well, how do we do it the other way? But I think it's an important question. Still. You know, yeah, but hey, this is the ramblings of an old fucking no. man going on now. So. And yet quite insightful. <laughs> <laughs> quite. Um, quite. <laughs> No, yeah, I I totally agree with you. Well, I'm last question, I guess. A lot of anarchists around the world in the last since 2012 at least and and more recently than that have been taking a lot of inspiration from the anarchist influenced organizing that's going on in northeastern Syria in the place that's often called Rojava. Uh Murray Bookchin had a lot to do with influencing the ideas there. Uh, used to be like straightforward Marxist Leninist, you know, uh, organization or influence with the PKK, but it, it it seems to also have stepped away from that since the late nineties and also presented a lot of really interesting community based options around power sharing across genders and between ethnic and religious groups. Um, I'm wondering if you've, if you know much about what's been going on, if you've been paying attention to it and if you, find it interesting no i know no more about it than the normal facebook feeds but i do see it as a source of inspiration (laughs) i'm not that daft i can see that i can see that sharing of ideas and different roles in the community and the the potential of of richness of that movement is to be something to be preserved and treasured and saved because there aren't that many of them let's be clear you know they they are actually not just reacting, they are creating wonderful things. And often we just react, but that they've taken a step forward. And the destruction of anything like that, no matter that it's not, you know, I know people are already beginning to say, well, it's not being anarchism. And it's not. But the, the it's a lot further on than mm. we've ever gone, isn't it? Mm. And it, it's a rich, beautiful thing. And we need to preserve it and support it. Absolutely. Well, Barry, it's been a really pleasure to to speak with you and I'm I'm thank you so much for for all your writing and for taking the time to do this. Well, no problem at all, man. And and if there's any other further questions, ask <laughs> I've got my whole script here and you just bloody ignore it. But uh, no. I, I thank you so much and good luck with your work and keep it going. And be safe. You and yours be safe out there, man. Thank be safe. You. Thanks you too. And I hope that you can get back to the US safely and yeah <laughs> oh yeah so do i i'm fucking gonna kill someone soon for a burrito but i i, I do as well and uh, thank you for your time good luck to all your listeners over there and tell them to keep up the good work because every time you know despair is so easy and sadness but find inspiration in the stronger the strong memories of people uh, like the anarchists we work with and other people you've known and, um, you know, you're not alone. No matter what fucking happens, you're not alone. As we have in past months, we'd like to invite you to submit a message to be aired on our 10th anniversary show coming up in a week and a half. We would like to hear about interviews that that touched you, any messages for the listenership, or just some kind words. You can send a voice memo or leave a message at one 528 571 you can also send a signal voice message to that account or email a link from Google Drive, we transfer share.riseup.net or another site to one of our email addresses. Thanks a lot. If you care to support the show, consider telling a friend about us, sharing an episode, rating us in iTunes, or reaching out with show ideas. We air on nine radio stations around the U.S. at the moment, and if you want to hear us in your area, reach out to us or take advantage of our radio broadcasting link up on our website, which is chock full of information you can send to a community or college radio station in your area. If you have dough you want to send our way, we accept one-time donations via PayPal or Venmo, as well as recurring donations via PayPal. 
Uh, we sell merch, which can be found at our big cartel, or you can sign up for a monthly donation via Patreon and we'll send you a thank you gift of a t-shirt or sticker pack, zine, or other gifts depending on the level of donation. All that info can be found at our website on the donate slash merch page. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.